keep the noise level down because I'm recording this lecture and you know I'm recording this in order for you to hear, not in order for me to hear these lectures because I don't really enjoy spending my free time listening to my own lectures. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like myself, but not that much. <laughs> <laughs> so, as usually, we will start by revising some important stuff. And the last in the last class, we talked about the forward rate, among other stuff. And we said the forward rate, this is the interest rate fixed today on a loan made in the future. So today you sign a contract for a loan in the future. Now, we said if you want to raise a money for a project that takes place in two years from now and lasts for one year, you can do it in two ways. You can wait for two years and go to a bank and bank will give you current spot rate. But looked from the today's perspective, this is risky because you have no idea what this rate is going to be in two years from now. Alternatively, you could go to a bank and ask them to give you a rate today and you sign a contract today that we will take a loan in two years from now. And the bank will give you what is called the forward rate. And this example shows very well what is the, <coughs> what is the forward rate. Now, we said the following. We said, okay, but which rate will bank give me? And I told you, well, you can actually infer that by doing one thought experiment. And let's do the following thought experiment. Let's imagine, let's imagine that you want to invest your money for three years in a bank. So you, today you invest your money for three years in a bank. Then Obviously, bank will give you three years spot rate. And after three years, if you invest $100, you will end up with the left-hand side of this equation. You will end up with 100 times 1 plus three years spot rate to the power of three. This is how much money you will accumulate after three years. Now, alternatively, you can do exactly the same investment by investing for two years today and signing a contract with a bank today that after two years you will invest not $100 but 100 times one plus <coughs> spot rate for two years to the power of two because you know that you will have 100 times one plus R2 to the power of two after two years. So you commit yourself today that every all that you will invest for one more year. And the bank tells you, okay, you get the forward rate from the year two to year three. Three. This is the definition of the forward rate. And now what I'm claiming is the left-hand side of the equation must be exactly the same as the right-hand side of the equation because you are doing exactly the same thing. Just in the first case, you have one piece of paper, one contract. In the second case, you have two pieces of paper. You have two contracts. But effectively, you have invested your money today for three years. Okay. We said this can be generalized by replacing 2 and 3 with A and B. And we did one example. We said, okay, if the R3 is 5%, if 2 years spot rate is 4%, then we can calculate 2 years two year forward rate, 1 year forward rate from year 2 to year 3 from this equation, and we get 7%. Now I will do two more examples because I see that many people are having trouble coping with this thing in the exam. So, two more examples. Example number one. Imagine that I give you two year zero treasury return. So this is what you get if you invest your money for two years today is 8.995%. If you invest your money today at the rate of nine, uh, for three years, you will get 9.66%. Now the question is, what is the third year forward rate? or the rate from the year two till the year three? And the answer is, it is the same thing to invest for two years and then one forward rate, one for one year at this forward rate, and to invest for three years. This is exactly the same example as in the previous case. And we divide both sides by one plus r two to the power of two, we subtract one and we have our forward rate. We just plug in the numbers for two and three year spot rates and we get to the solution of 11%. Let's 
Now, let's complicate things just a little bit more. It's actually not any more complicated, it's just a different example. Imagine that two years from now, you intend to begin a project that will last for five years. What discount rate should be used when evaluating the project? And I give you the two-year spot rate and the seven-year spot rate. Now, you can say the following. I repeat the same thought experiment. It must be the same. If I invest my money today for seven years at the seven-year spot rate, and it mu this must be the same too, investing my money for two years at the two-year spot rate, and obliging myself that I will invest everything that I get after these two years for five more years at the forward rate from year two till year five. So this equation must hold. Investment for seven years, for s uh, the seven year rate for seven years must be the same as investment at the two years rate for two years and you reinvest everything that you get for five years at this forward rate from the year two till year seven. It is exactly the same thing. You invest your money for seven years. So these things must be equal. So we can solve this equation. We divide everything by one plus r, two to the power of two. We take the fifth root of both sides and we subtract one and we have our forward rate from year two till year seven. Now, if we plug in the numbers from this example, we solve for this forward rate and we will get 7.88%. Now, there was one question that I got in one of the previous lectures. And one person asked me, but you know, if you observe this rate, this forward rate from year two to till year seven, this is a rate that you get annually for investment of five years. And this is 7.88%. How come that this rate is higher than what you get for investment of seven years annually? How can this be? And my answer is the following. Try to think about, for example, this seven-year spot rate. What are these rates trying to capture? They're trying to capture risk. The higher the rate, the higher the risk is. Now think about it in the following way. This seven-year spot rate is kind of an average rate that you will get every year for these seven years. It's not an average. It's not that you take these numbers and divide them by seven numbers and divide them by seven. It's not. We know that because of compounding. It's more complicated. But think about it as some kind of an average that you would get for each of the next seven years. And this rate, forward rate from year two till year seven, is some kind of an average that you would get from the years two till the year seven. And there is more uncertainty from year two till year seven, on average, than from year one till year seven. Okay? You get the idea? So this is actually more risky because on average, this is further away in the future than this thing over here. But keep in mind, keep in mind one thing, that this rate that we have calculated, this is implied, this comes from the spot rates. So this is implied by the current market conditions. You know, this is taken from the yield curve. These numbers are from some yield curve. And if the yield curve is increasing with maturities, if it's a normal yield curve, what we call, then you will observe this kind of behavior. But in some different market conditions, when you have an inverted yield curve, which is decreasing with maturities, you won't observe that because inverted yield curve tells us that investments in the future are less risky than those, than those now. Okay. Any questions regarding these subjects, forward rates? Yeah, but on average, it's further away because this is average annual rate. So this is kind, it's not an average. It's some, some type of a special average, average annual rate that you will get for 
from year two till year three, from year three to year four, from year four to year five. And you know, for this first, for this spot rate, you, also you are also averaging across the first two years, which are closer to us. So on, in a sense, if you want to really simplify this, but this is not really a correct thing that I will say. So on average, this is like something in between year one and year seven. So on average, this is three and a half years from now. And this thing over here, this is from year three, basically to year seven. So this is on average like five years away from now. So this is on average further away in the future because this, do this, this rate does not cover the closest two years. This does not cover first two years, year one and year two. Okay, then we talked about the inflation. And we said the inflation is a very important concept because it actually tells you how much more stuff or how much less stuff you can buy over time. And we said, in order to understand what the inflation is, we first have to figure out how do we measure the inflation. <coughs> and we said, in order to measure the inflation, <coughs> we measure some things, some things that an average person buys. And we measure the price of these things, and let's call this basket a consumer price index. It tells us what is the price of a stuff that average person will buy, like pay a, a rent for the apartment or a mortgage for his house or some housing costs, fuels, some services, I mean scholarship fees, uh, food, transportation, whatever. And then we observe the same basket of goods one year later and we observe that what costed $100 now costs $102. And that means that we have observed an inflation of 2%. Now the problem with the inflation is that it's very, very difficult to measure properly. Now why is it difficult to measure properly? I gave you an example. Everybody has a TV set or a computer nowadays in Germany. So if you want to report uh, an inflation for, for for uh, Germany, you have, to, you have to somehow take into account prices of computers. But, you know, computer produced in year T is not produced anymore in year T plus one. Which computer do you take into account? Or TV set, or you don't use Nokia phones anymore. You use smartphones, iPhones. Should you take an iPhone or a Nokia phone? F these phones don't even exist after one year. Now, to make things even more complicated, there are lots of things that one person needs. And actually, if you see this, this table reports consumer price index for all urban consumers in the US. Now, what do you do for Germany? For example, there are different costs of living in Hamburg and different costs of living in some village in Rheingau. Also, Hamburg is much colder. You will spend much more money on heating in Hamburg than in Rheingau. And you will see also, you have unadjusted index, seasonally adjusted index. This is complicated because you spend more fuel for heating in winter and less in the summer. You drink more juices in summer than in winter. I mean, this is so complicated. Even clothing is differently priced for winter and for the summer. You wear, you are basically naked in the summer and you wear expensive stuff in the winter. It's complex. And, but the fact that it's complex wouldn't be a problem by itself. But the fact that something is complex and that the person that is calculating it has an incentive to cheat, this together creates a problem. Because if it's a complex and if person that is estimating it is totally unbiased in estimation things, he has a good incentive to most, most probably he will get it right with some error, but these errors will be random over time. But this is not what we observe. The problem is that the people that are calculating this have an incentive to cheat. 
and due to complexity, it's very easy to cheat. There are hundreds of numbers. I mean, this is just a, this is just a small part of this table. And in this table, you will see alcoholic beverages, food away from home that you eat in restaurants, other foods, fats and oils, sugars and sugar and sweets. I mean, this is just a small part of this table. This table is huge. And they can really easy hide information in this table. And they are doing it because they have incentive. This is calculated by governments and governments want you to think that the inflation is low or non-existent. Because they want you to think that your salary is worth the same thing as it was last year and not less. You don't want, they don't want to have people complaining, yeah, we don't earn enough money. And I gave you an example why I believe that, for example, in Germany, this, this information is misrepresented. I told you, I came to Germany two and a half years ago, and they tell you over the last three years, inflation was like 1%. It was very low inflation period. And then you go to a gas station. Now I pay 1.5 euro for gas. And two and a half years I was paying one dollar per liter of fuel. So there was like 50% increase in fuel prices. And they tell me that the inflation is 1%. I simply don't believe in these numbers. This is, this is wrong. I use fuel for heating. I use fu fuel for driving. I, fuel is used to produce almost any product. Some people try to approximate inflation by observing some specific goods. In this example that I gave you, I say, let's observe price of apples. Some people will tell you the good price indicator is price of a Big Mac. There is a Big Mac index that you can check online. It tells you how prices of Big Mac changed over time in different in cunt all countries around the world where you have McDonald's. And I gave you an example. OK, let's imagine that we have some good measure of inflation, which we don't. But let's pretend that we have it. Then if you know what the inflation rate is, then how do you take it into account? Imagine that you have $100 today, and that the price of one Apple, price of one Big Mac, consumer price index, whatever, is $1, $1 per Apple. So I can buy 100 apples for this $100. After one year, let's say I have invested this money and I have earned one, I have $110. I have earned 10% more money. This is what we call a nominal return. How much more money I get after one year. And I get 10% more money. Now imagine that the price of apples has increased over this year. Now apples don't cost $1 one apple, they cost one dollar and three cents one apple. Then in a year from now, I will be able to buy 106.8 apples because 110 divided by 103 is 106.8. Now the question is, OK, we had a 3% inflation. So what is my real return? My nominal return is, as we said, is 10%. I get 10% more money. This is nominal, yes. But what is real? How much more stuff I can buy? From this equation, it's obvious. From this diagram, it's obvious. I can buy 6.8% more apples. And pay attention. The real interest rate is not just nominal minus the inflation. So it's not 10% nominal minus 3% inflation. I get 7% more. No, I don't. I get 6.8. 6.8 is different than 7. I don't give you a formula how to calculate this, because this is so simple that you don't need a formula. You have it in the slides from the previous class. But you don't need it. Real interest rate is just how much more stuff you can buy. The inflation is how much have prices increased. Nominal is how much more money you get. I mean, just thinking about this concept without any formula is enough that you are able to calculate anything. Just think about it. How much more stuff I can buy is the real interest rate? Well, if the price of Apple has jumped, I mean, this is elementary school exercise. If price of apples has jumped from $1 to $1.03, I can buy 6.8% more apples. This is the real interest rate, full stop. 
Okay, we move now to chapter 5 in the old version of the book. I think that in the new version of the book is chapter 4. It covers the same stuff. The chapters are basically the same. They are just numerated in a different way. So this chapter talks about stocks, how they are traded, how they are valued, uh, how do we estimate some cost of equity capital, stock prices, blah, blah, blah. So first let's talk about how stocks are traded. I remember the example from one of our first classes. I think it was uh, even the first class. I told you, Dutch East India Company wants to raise money to buy ships, to send them to India to trade spices. And how does it work? They would gather I potential investors and they would give a speech how great company this Dutch East India Company is and that investors should invest money. Today this would be called you give a pitch talk in front of the investors. You gather investors, you give a really great talk how great you are and how great your company is. You try to convince them to give you the highest valuation the possible. So you try to convince them that your company is the best company in the world and they will give you some money for the stake in your company. So they will take the ownership in your company in exchange to give you some money. And this is what you usually call over-the-counter over the counter investment. So you basically, why it's called over-the-counter? I mean, it's like in a store. You have a counter and I try to convince you into something and I sell you things over-the-counter. I sell you things directly. I sell you directly ownership in my company. Now, the other ways to sell, sell stocks is at the stock exchanges. And until recently, probably the most popular way to sell stocks was what was called auction markets. And this is the picture that you have in your head when you think about the New York Stock Exchange. If you think about, if you ever seen how New York Stock Exchange looks like, it's a huge place with lots of people on the floor and some people standing in some elevated places. And these people in these elevated places say something and people on the floor signal with their hands. What's basically taking place there is that this guy is somehow intermediating between sellers and buyers. He says, okay, somebody wants to buy this stock and the other guy says, okay, I offer 96. The other guy says, I offer 97. And the auction, live auction is taking place, bidding. Who bids more, who bids more, who bids more. This is what takes place. Then when th this is sold, then the other guy is trading the other company. And until 2007, this was the only way that you could have bought stocks at the New York Stock Exchange. So even if you called your broker to buy stocks at the largest stock exchange in the world, until 2007, this broker had to call his guy on standing on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and he would do these funny signals with his hands in order to buy. I mean, this is the only way that you could have done it until 2007 at the largest stock exchange in the world. In 2007, New York Stock Exchange bought Euronext. And Euronext is something like Nasdaq. It's a dealer market. It's an online stuff. It's an online thing where you trade online. And how does it work? Well, it started in 1971. There was no internet. Forget the internet. Internet started to exist in the, in the early 90s. In 70s, 80s, there was no internet. But you could still connect to Nasdaq server. Actually, this server was less powerful than your cell phone today. And it was something like an internet forum. You, you could leave messages. You connect, you dial in with your modem, you connect to a line of a Nasdaq server, and you leave a message, I wanna buy this stock. That, then after half an hour, you check whether somebody replied to your message. But you know, no, there was no internet, so you had to dial in, and there were hundreds of people trying to dial in into, I don't know, four, 15, 20, I don't know how many modem lines Nasdaq had at that time. So it was difficult even to connect to Nasdaq because lines were always busy, always but there was somebody else trying to connect to Nasdaq. But things have changed dramatically with the, with the emergence of internet. Now trades take place in the real time. And when I tell you in the real time, and why do we talk about this 
con- instantaneous rates. Why do we talk about continuous compounding? Because some people make, there are these people that are called high frequency traders. They make thousands of trades per second. So they are not trading one trade per second, one trade per day. No, they are making <coughs> thousands of trades per second. And you know where it leads to? It leads to that it's nowadays it's important how close to New York you are because speed of light is not fast enough to transfer you the information about the price. If you sit in Frankfurt, you will receive the information about the stock prices at the speed of light. And you know, it takes some time to travel even to the light from, from New York to Frankfurt. So guy in, in New York will know you have a better information about the current price of the stock. Even 300,000 kilometers per second is not enough to transfer information fast enough. Not to mention our current IT infrastructure. You know, when you plug in this cable into your computer, the information is transmitted using some communication protocol. There is a way how bits and bytes are sent through this cable, and this is called TCP IP protocol. Well, If you want to really have a good communication, you won't use TCP IP protocol because it's stupid. It was built in the 70s. There are much faster protocols. And you cannot buy this stuff. You go to a shop and you buy a non-TCP IP (coughs) card or whatever. Your operating system even doesn't know about these modern, better protocols. But people doing high frequency trading, they have developed better protocols that communicate much faster than the TCP IP protocol to be able to get this information as fast as possible. Okay, the final way how you can trade with stocks is through the exchange traded funds. Where you do not buy stocks directly, you buy investment unit of the exchange traded fund. This fund is traded at the exchange and you buy the part of this fund. And your return is in a sense the prof dependent on the return that this fund is making. But this fund is nothing more than the collection of stocks. They invest into stocks. They, for example, this one fund can invest one dollar in IBM, one dollar in Microsoft stock. Then your, if you own part of this fund, your return will depend on the return on the Microsoft and IBM stock. So indirectly you are owning these stocks, by, but directly you are not owning. You are not the owner of the stock. You are the owner of the investment unit of this fund. Okay, we have seen this picture many times. Companies have assets. Assets is everything that company has in its possession that can be used to convert to future benefits. This is everything from cash to tables to pencils to cars, machines, computers, whatever company owns and can be used to convert to future benefits. Now, but company also owns some money to some other people. These are called liabilities, debts. They own some money to some banks. They have issued some bonds. So basically what equity holders own, shareholders, people that own parts in this company, they own everything assets, but they have to decrease this value of assets for the value of debt, because they have to repay this debt somehow. So you will often see debt plus equity is equal to assets, or liabilities plus equity is equal to assets. And I gave you an example of one, one annual company report. So every company in the US is obliged to submit what is called annual report on a 10K form to the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's not important for you to remember this 10K. I mean, 10K is just a random name. They have 13F for insider trading. They have this or that. I don't know these names. But 10K is just a name. Somebody asked me, where does it come from? I have no idea where does it comes from. Probably some historical reasons. And I'm sure that in Germany, as as, as a bureaucratic country as Germany is, You probably have lots of these forms. When you go to municipality, you have to film form 23.2 AC, whatever, I don't know. But this is a 10K report. And in this 10K report, every company has to report everything that has shaped their previous fiscal year. And this is one 
one part of one big table from this report. These reports are usually pretty lengthy. But I guess you talk about this in your accounting classes. Um, actually, I have no idea whether you have accounting classes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just inventing things. <laughs> but <coughs> if you look at this, this report, you will see that, for example, this is a report of Microsoft, the latest report of Microsoft, we can, which you can find online. Because as soon as these reports are submitted, they are published online on the website of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And if you check this report, of Microsoft, you will see that total assets of Microsoft are $108 billion. But observe also one stunning number in this sheet. Total liabilities, total debt of Microsoft is $51 billion. $51 bil they own $50 billion to some other people, companies, banks, whatever. This is more than some country own. I mean, this is, this is debt. I, I bet Hungary owns less than this. Croatia, Serbia, they own the small countries placed in Europe own less than this. Germany is pretty much in debt, so I, it's more than this. But this is a lot of money. This is $50 billion, and this is just one company. Now, if you look what is actually total value of the equity, what equity holders have, it must be a difference between these two numbers. And these two numbers must add <coughs> to each other. <coughs> and actually, you know, these numbers must add to one dollar. If there is a one dollar mistake, it turns out that one person is criminally liable in the US for this mistake. Again, I don't know, do you have actually accounting class? Okay, then some of you do, some of you don't, I don't know. Maybe it's not obligatory. But the point is, in the accounting science, in 2000, I'm not sure, 2003, 2006, I'm not an accountant. So there was a law introduced in the US called Sarbanes-Oxley Act. This was a law that changed accounting accounting principles in the US dramatically. And it changed it in the following way. It made CEO, chief executive officer, criminally liable if there is something wrong with this report. This was basically initiated by the big frauds that took place in the US with Enron scandal, WorldCom scandal. There were these big scandals where some huge companies were faking numbers in their reports. They were lying to their investors and to the public. And then US government said, okay, from now on, the CEO is criminally liable for if there is something wrong with these numbers. And this has actually completely changed the accounting practice in the US. It has dramatically increased the costs of operation of companies because from then on, all the communication of the board of director of every corporation has to be recorded. Just imagine huge companies like Procter & Gamble. They communicate, you know, you have a communication from, I don't know, New York, to Siberia. They have offices everywhere. This, has, this must be recorded. Just imagine how much infrastructure cost this has inferred. Everything has to be recorded. So we want to know who make these fake things. We want to make people liable. And accounting science has changed dramatically since this is recent phenomenon. I'm not sure about the year. You can ask your accounting professor. 2006, 2007, 2003, I have no idea. But it's in 2000 something. Okay, now the question is, why would anybody want to buy a share of a company? Why would you like to buy a piece of a company? Well, the answer is because you want to share the profits. If you own part of the company, you want to get part of the profits. Now, what do you expect to get when you buy a company? Let's say you pay today a price of P0. This is the price that you pay today for, let's say, one share of Microsoft. This gives you, you are owner of, I don't know, X percents of Microsoft now. Now, what do you get when you buy this share? 
you expect that after one year you will get maybe some dividends plus if you sell this share after one year you will also earn on the price difference p1 minus p0 if price has increased you will make some profit on the increase of price and you will also get these dividends so how much in percents you earn over this year you earn profits divided by what you have paid so these are the profits dividend plus the difference in the price p1 minus p0 divided by the price that you have paid and this is what you expect to earn if you own a company but we can also try to think about the company as one giant cash flow stream so over time you will receive some dividends and when you decide to sell the company you will sell, sell it after this is H period of time so after H period of time you will sell it for PH and then if you observe this cash flow stream this looks very much like a bond so the current price of a company could be just a discounted cash flow stream of this company now the point with the bonds is you have coupons and in final time period you have last coupon plus the face value but these numbers are deterministic this is something that is in the contract this is written on a bond when you buy it with companies when you buy a company stock nobody will tell you over next 10 years you will get a dividend of five dollars nobody will tell you anything what you will get you have no idea what you will get and even less you know about for what money you will be able to sell this company after 10 years let's say nobody knows that so valuing of companies is a bit more complex is a bit more complex thing than when you valuing a bonds but the idea is the same you have a cash flow stream you have to discount it and this will give you a price of a company today price of a stock today so let's think about <coughs> let's think about one one example if you open Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and even you have some special website that try to sell you information about, about future, about some estimates, some analysts, people are called analysts that do this kind of thing, try to sell you information about what are the future prospects of some company, how much dividends they are going to be give you, for what price you are going to be able to sell this company, etc. So if you observe, this is example. In this example, analyst tells you, you will receive a dividend of $3 in a year from now, I of $3.24 in two years from now, $3.50 in three years from now, and in three years from now, you will be able to sell this company for this stock for 94.48. And let's say that this company is as risky as other companies that offer you 12% return. Then the fair price of this company we would calculate it just like a price of like a present value of any cash flow stream we would discount first first cash flow with the one year discount factor second cash flow with two year discount factor and the last cash flow with a three year discount factor and you would get seventy five dollars this should be to the power of three and not times three I don't know what's written in your slides okay <coughs> So, what am I trying to tell you with this example? I'm trying to tell you the following, that the price of a company today can be calculated if, for example, you intend to keep the company for one year, it can be calculated as a discounted dividend and a price that you will receive in a year from now. This is clear. But now you will ask me, do you, do you you will tell me, man, do you think that I'm so stupid? You are telling me that I can calculate price of something today and then you plug in the price tomorrow. I mean, if you don't know price today, how, c how can I expect you to believe that you know price tomorrow, in a year from now? And then I will tell you, but no, look, we can actually look as two years from now. It must be that the price of a company today is the sum of discounted dividends for two years and then price in two years discount. And then you will tell me, this guy really thinks that we are stupid. I mean, he tells me that price today, yeah, he doesn't know price today, he doesn't know price tomorrow, but 
he knows price in two years. But I will tell you then, but look, you can do it, you can push it even further. You can say, let's observe three years from now. Then he will tell me, this is a joke. Yeah, three years from now, you know. And then I will tell you, yeah, I don't know, but I can push it even further. I can push it four years from now. And then he will tell me, you will lose all interest. But then I will tell you, wait, we can push it even further. We can push it 50 years away from now. And you will tell me, so what? And I will tell you, but look, observe carefully. <laughs> you are discounting now this price with the 1 plus r to the power of 50. And let's say that you estimate that this price is $100, that P50 is $100. And let's say that the r is 10%. <laughs> then the present value of this uh, last element in this, in this sum is actually 8 cents. So even if I miss this price for double, let's say I said this is 50. It's not 100, it's 50. I have missed the estimate of the value of this company just for 4 cents. Let's imagine that this, that this dividend is $1. This is nothing. This is a small mistake in the estimate. And I can push this argument even further. We can say, OK, how much total present value comes from dividends and how much it comes from the present value of the future of the future sales price if we increase this horizon this will go to some very very small fraction will come actually from the from the from this final sales price and actually <coughs> we can be even correct by saying okay let's assume that i hold this company forever forever and ever again and let's pretend for a moment that this company actually pays constant dividends over time. This dividend is a constant over time. Then this company cash can, can be represented as a cash flow, which is just a normal perpetuity. Constant amounts of money every year forever. Now, whether this is a good approximation of a company or not, we will discuss about this a bit more. But the point is, if this is true, then it's really easy to calculate the, the present value of a company. You just need one estimate one number. You need to estimate what are the next year's dividends and assume that these dividends go forever like this. And now think about the following. Think about when company will be able to pay constant dividends over time and when company will grow. Because actually if you observe in the market companies usually grow over time. They get larger and larger and they pay higher and higher dividends. I mean this is the idea they get better and better over time. But when they will not be able to get better, when they pay out all the profits to their shareholders. If I, so I have some profit as a company and I can decide to do two things. As a CEO, I can say, pay out all the profits to the shareholders. Or alternatively, I can say, invest part of these dividends to the future growth of company. But if I pay out all the dividends, every year I will be able to just repeat the same thing. I won't be able to grow. So if I pay out all earnings, earnings are equal to dividends, and this is when company is not growing. So in the case when there is no growth, but only in the case when there is no growth, this becomes earnings per share divided by R. Because dividends are the same things as earning per share when the company decides not to grow. When they decide not to invest any profits in their future growth. This EPS is earnings per share. This is how much they earn per sh unit per share, per stock. And as I said, this is only if all earnings are paid to the shareholders. This is, if all earnings are paid to the shareholders, this equation becomes earnings per share. But if you observe in the market, you will see actually that companies usually grow. You will observe two kinds of companies, companies that grow and companies that die. Well, companies that die, they're usually worth nothing. But companies that grow, the question is how much they are worth. Well, this looks like our constant growth perpetuity if they grow at some constant rate. And we know how to calculate the value of the constant growth perpetuity. And again, the only things that we need to estimate are dividends 
in the year from now, and we need to estimate the growth rate. Now, the problem with this model, and this is a very popular, this Gordon growth model is a very popular model, is that in reality, growth rates change over time. If you observe companies, one year they will grow 3%, one year they will grow 7%. We know that economy has this kind of business cycles. It go grows faster, it grows slower. It grows faster, it grows slower. We are always in some form of a business cycle. We have booms, we have recessions. Also, what if the company does not pay dividend next year? What is your dividend next year? If it's zero, I mean this equation is zero, whatever R and G are. The next problem is when the R is very similar to G. Then this equation becomes really sensitive. This price, estimate, your estimate of the price of a stock becomes really sensitive to estimate of any of these three numbers. Because when R is close to G, this number is close to zero. And then you are dividing some number with something close to zero. So if you are wrong in your estimate in the dividend, a little bit, you will be wrong in the for the estimate of the price quite a lot. Similarly, if you're wrong in your estimates in R and G, you will end up making a large mistake. But now the question that you are going to ask me is, okay, but I mean, why, the, why on earth I would like to do something like this? You know, for companies that are traded at the stock exchange, you just type in, in Google Finance and you check the price of the company. It's as easy as that. But there are many companies whose price you cannot check. I ask you, give me the price of Twitter. <coughs> it's a huge company. It's $8 billion worth. But what's the price of Twitter? We don't know because it's not traded. You cannot buy that easily stocks of Twitter. They are not trading on any stock exchange. This is one example why you need. But even when it comes to large companies that are traded at the stock exchanges, you need it. And to give you an example when you need it, let's observe one big litigation that is taking place now in Germany. You have the case currently taking place in Germany where Motorola is putting a big charge against Apple to stop selling their products because they are violating Motorola's intellectual property right. Motorola has some patents and they claim Apple is not paying them th some fees to use these patents and they are asking a German judge to f to stop to make Apple stop selling some of their products in Germany. And the Apple lawyers approach the judge and they tell him, you know, if you make a stop this sales now, and what, what if Motorola is wrong? What if we think that we are not violating their patents? We will lose a lot of money in this process then, and it will turn out that we are innocent. Who will give us this money? Then judge says to Motorola, okay, if you want to continue with this process, you have to guarantee that you will cover all the losses to Apple if it turns out that they, are, they have not violated your rights. And the judge asks Motorola, okay, you have to give me a bond. And actually, this is what German judge is asking. You have to give me a bond that if it turns out that you are making a false claim, I will give to an Apple. And this bond has to be of a size of what is the estimated loss of a value of the whole Apple corporation if, I've m if I make them stop selling their products in Germany. And Apple comes up and say, this we estimate that we will lose around two billion in total value of a company if, if you make a stop, stop selling your pro these products in Germany now. And you know, judge, he's not a finance guy, he's a judge and he has to ask now, Okay, I, is this two billion really a fair estimate or not? How do I know whether this is a fair estimate? You could have told me 100 billion. How do I know that this is actually two billion? You know, you are a global corporation, you are trading in every country in the world, and we are just a tiny Germany compared to the whole world. And you are saying you are gonna lose two billion. How do you come to this number? And then he asks Apple's lawyers, to come up with some explanation. And Apple's lawyers most likely will come up with formula similar to this. This is the most frequently used formula in courts when it comes to, to litigation of this kind. They have to assume that something will happen with their growth, whatever. And you know, you could come up with a much more complex model. 
you could come up with a stochastic differential equation that describes evolution of the Apple stock over time and do some Monte Carlo simulation. But can you explain that to a judge? I mean, judge is a lawyer. You can explain at most to him what I can explain to you in 45 minutes. And you know, I can explain you this formula in 45 minutes. Therefore, judge is not nor more stupid nor smarter than you are. So he can probably understand this formula as well. And this is why this formula is so important. It's actually used a lot in, in litigations when it comes to publicly traded companies. It's used a lot in all countries around the world. And why is this especially important for the Germany? Germany has this culture of litigation. I mean, it's a popular sport to sue somebody in Germany. People do that all the time. This is much more popular in Germany than probably in any country in the world. And judges always ask in Germany, this is also very specific to Germany, to ask a bond. To ask a bond as a guarantee that if he makes a mistake, that, that this other party will not be punished. But also this formula can be used to infer some things about what market think about some companies. Imagine the following example. Imagine that you know that the price of one company is $100 per share. That if you want to buy one share of a company, it's $100. And you know that this company will pay $3 per share next year. They will pay $3 in dividends. And let's say that this company is as risky as other companies that pay 12% that have expected return of 12%. Then you can infer from this formula what does the market expect about the growth of this company. It turns out that market expects that this company will grow at a rate of 9%. Okay. <coughs> now, we have to figure out how do we get to this G. Where do we get this growth from? Dividends and R, we will have a special class dedicated to estimation of R discount rates. We have to figure out the relationship between risk and return. And we have special classes dedicated. Now let's figure out where does the G comes from. So, firm has some earnings. I will call earnings and profits, I will use the same word. In your accounting classes, you will probably use different, you will probably distinguish what are earnings and profits. I'm not an accountant. I have no idea what's the difference between earnings and profits, and I call this the same thing. You will probably get failed <laughs> in the accounting classes if you mix this kind of words. In my class, I don't care. Earnings, profits, that's the same, that's the same stuff. I don't know. Maybe it has to do something with tax. I, I, I really don't know. But I don't think it's that important to understand these concepts. So what can firm do with their profits? with their earnings. I will use these words interchangeably. Sometimes I will say profit, sometimes I will say earnings, and I will mean the same stuff. So what can firm do with their earnings? They can decide to pay part of it to, to their stockholders as dividends. You know, I as a stockholder, I expect some part of the profits. This is why I bought this stock. So part of it they will give me as 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 dividends. And this fraction, this percent of profits that is paid out as dividends is called payout ratio. Now the other part of these earnings, firm can invest into their operations to extend their business, to buy new ships. And this is what is called a plowback ratio. And the plowback ratio, it comes from plowing back into company, giving back to company. Now the question is, can we, if we know these things, can we somehow figure out what is the growth rate of a company? If we know what is the standard thing that this company does? Because usually companies have policies how much they pay as dividends and how much they reinvest. And it turns out that actually there is a very neat way to figure this out, that the growth rate is actually equal to the this blowback ratio times return on equity. Now, you will get different definitions of what is return on equity, but I would like you to think about it in the following way. Imagine you are this Dutch East India company that is trading spices between, between India and Europe. So what is their return on equity? They know if they invest additional $100 into their business to build ships, 
they will be able to make, I don't know, 25% on that. That is their uh, return on equity. So this is the percentage that you get on the additional investment in the company operations. So company will grow at the rate of what is your return on equity, the return on equity times the percentage of your profits that you invest back in your company. This will become more clear if we observe the following example. Imagine that there is a company and that this company will pay, have profits of $8.33 in a year from now. If a company has earnings of $8.33 per share, that means that they can do two things. They can just pay out everything to the, their shareholders. If they pay out everything to the shareholders, next year they will be able to do exactly the same thing. Next year, if they pay out everything to the shareholders, they will do exactly the same thing because they cannot grow. There is no additional money to grow the business. So in this case, the price of a stock will be just a normal perpetuity. There is no growth. Every year they pay $8.33 forever. And we discount it with a rate that you could get by investing in a similarly risky company. And you get $55.56 per share. This is price of one stock of this company. Now, alternatively, imagine that this company they are running a business of like Dutch East India Company, they are building ships. And they know that for each dollar that they can invest into this business, they can get 25% return. This is their return on equity. So now imagine that instead of paying out everything, paid out $8.33 per share to their share shareholders, they decide actually to invest 40% of these dividends. So now 40% of dividends is inv reinvested and they intend to do that every year. Now, what they will do? What do you get? Well, what I told you, we expect that the growth rate of this company is then return on equity. This is how much they can get when they reinvest their money and they have reinvested 40% of the profit. That means that they will grow at the rate of 10%. So now what's going to be the value of this stock? What's going to be the value of this stock? It will be C1 over R minus G. Now we have growth. Now this is constant growth perpetuity. This is not perpetuity. This is growing perpetuity. And it grows at a rate of 10%. But note that this first size of the first payment is different. It's not $8.33. Because they decided to keep, to reinvest 40% of $8.33. $3. So what is this 5%? $5. The $5 is 8.33 times 1 minus 0 0.4. This is what you actually pay out as dividend. This is your, your flow back ratio is 40%. Your payout ratio is 60%. So what you pay out as dividend is 60% of your profits. And how do you get to this 60%? Well, if you decide to plow back 40%, that means that you are paying out 60%. So this is how we get to this number five. So if company decides to reinvest 40% of its profits every year, then it will grow at a rate of 10% and then price of this share should be $100. If there is no growth, price is $55. And actually the difference between these two numbers, so there is no growth 55 with growth 100 and difference between these two numbers is what we call the present value of growth opportunities. So this is the difference between in the case when you grow minus when you don't grow. So present value of growth opportunities in this case is $44. So what is this present value of growth opportunities? This is the net present value of the future investments. This is what you get if you invest. This is what you get additionally if you decide for these investments. Part of the profits are invested. Now, it must be around 56 minutes of the class. No, it's 59. Because in all previous groups, 
I see the increase of noise and the fall of concentration between 56th and 58th minute. Now you are 59, you are the best one. <laughs> you have managed to survive this torture for the longest period of time. You are the record holders. <laughs> this was a joke that was there to wake you up when this happens. Now, but there is one important thing. When you try to think about the company as a something, as a, as a thing that will continue to live forever and grow at some constant rate, you have to make sure that this is actually some sustainable growth rate. It cannot be 40%. You can, there is no company that grows forever for 40%. These companies don't exist. So let's talk about how you actually in reality try to value a company that is, for example, not traded. You don't know the price of this company, but somehow you can estimate cash flows. You can estimate earnings of this company. So imagine that you have some company. So the formal way to do it would be just add, estimate all the future cash flow streams. You're estimating all the future cash flow streams from now till infinity and you discount them and you sum them. This is the value of the company. Value of the company comes from the all future cash flow streams, expected future cash flow streams discounted. This is the value of the company. Now, the problem is that we cannot reliably estimate things that will happen in 50 years from now. We can maybe estimate profits of a company three years from now, maybe five years from now, but even 20 years from now, it's very, very difficult thing to do. So what people actually do is they separate, they are making separate estimates of the first few years where they can actually estimate value cash flows well, and then they assume this company will continue growing at some, some stable rate in the future. So you would usually calculate the present value of the cash flow streams that you can explicitly estimate and add to that some terminal value which comes from the constant growth. You would assume that from let's say 10 years on your company is growing at some constant rate forever. Now <coughs> we know that when, when, when you know, firm grows at constant rate, you can estimate this thing as a constant growth perpetuity. So we know the formula for constant growth perpetuity. Now the important thing is when you are trying to, to estimate, this, estimate this rate, this constant growth has to be a stable growth rate. This is something that you can, that you can, you can think of it as something that company actually can sustainably continue to grow forever at this rate. So many companies can maintain high growth rates for some extended period, but they will approach at some point this stable growth rate. And this stable growth rate is something that you use to estimate the present value of this terminal cash flow. So we said if you have this first series of cash flows that you model explicitly and then you assume that the company is growing at a some rate. So usually you assume things like this. Usually you can assume that company is already in this stable growth period so you just model your company as a constant growth perpetuity. Alternatively you can assume that there will be a high growth rate for next 10 years and then after that company will grow at some low low growth rate, some stable growth rate. Or you can assume company grows at some high rates, then gradually decreases this rate over next few years until it reaches stable growth rate and then continues growing at a stable growth rate forever. Now, the question is the assumptions of how long this high growth rate will continue. This depends on a case by case. And for example, for large firms, you cannot, this usually you assume shorter high growth periods. Or if the current growth rate is high, it's more likely that it will continue to be high for a longer period than if your current growth rate is low. Also, the market conditions play uh, an important role in when you try to model this cash flow stream. Because if you are working in a field where, which is very competitive, 
it is likely to assume that your competitors will catch up on you very very fast and you will not be able to you will not be able to continue to grow at this high growth rate or barrier of entry this is also important i mean how likely it is that you will get new competitors in this field if it's unlikely then you might continue growing at a higher rate for the longer periods of time now <coughs> the important thing is that not only growth rate is important but the Discount rate is important because we have dividend over R minus G. G is important, but R is also important. And it turns out that we will talk, dedicate a couple of classes to talking about this discount rate. But the point is that this discount rate somehow should be related to the risk of this business. The riskier the business is, the higher the rate should be. Okay, so I told you what's the idea. You estimate somehow these profits, some people call them free cash flow, some people call them earnings, I don't know. I don't know what's the appropriate in accounting terms. In the book they call them free cash flows, for me this is profit, this is what you can actually expect to get from the company, because as a stock owner you expect share of profits. So you explicitly model this first couple of period free cash flows and then you assume that at some point, this company will continue growing at a constant, constant rate. So to give you an example, if you become a consultant, and many of you do become consultants after this school, you will go to McKinsey, you will go to companies like this. And what will most likely your first job going to be? What, so what consultants do when they are young? Well, consultants are sent by their bosses to evaluate some businesses either to see how can you improve this business, but in order to say whether you can improve it, you have to first know what is the value of this business today. Or they will ask you, okay, this company wants to buy this business, estimate the value of this business, and they will send you to this company <coughs> to evaluate this company. And how does this evaluation usually look? They, they give you an assignment, and this assignment is you are supposed to do something with a fancy name. You are supposed to do a due diligence. And the due diligence consists of you are sent to this company where they lock you in a room like this with lots of folders. Exactly like in this room. You have folders in this closet in your back. And they tell you, okay, for next 24 hours, you can look in every folder in this room and you somehow ha have to come up with the estimate of the future profits. But note that the equation that I have showed you before, it talks only about the future. It doesn't take talk about the past. And in this folder, you can only find data about the past. <coughs> I mean, some of the things in this folder determine cash flows in the future. For example, if this company has, has some loan, that will be repaid in the future. This loan will be written somewhere in one of these folders and you have to dig it out. You have to dig out all the information that will help you forecast future profits. So you somehow say, okay, let's assume that this company has some assets and that these assets will grow over time. Also, it has earnings, it has investments and the difference between investments and earnings is what some people call free cash flows, we can call them profits. And actually, for the value of this company, the profits are the only thing that is going to be important. So what is our goal? Our goal is to, cr to come up to our boss with something like this, with the future cash flow of this company. This is what he cares about. He's a busy man. He will not read your, I don't know, marketing studies of 20 pages. He doesn't care about it. Yeah, maybe in order to achieve this, maybe in order to achieve this cash flow, you have to invest lots of money in marketing. But he doesn't care about these details. He cares about, okay, even if you do that, how much money do you get? How much is this in dollars, not in marketing hours, experts or whatever? How much is that in dollars today? So you somehow say, okay, this, let's say, let's pretend that this is our bakery story that we had in a couple of lectures. Let's say you are a baker and that you, you are buying a small bakery and by buying this small bakery, you are extending your business. And you have 10 bakery shops. And you know basically 
how baking business works. You know that your average baker store that you own grows at a rate of 6%. So this is what you can actually see in this slide. Your goal is that after seven years, you get 6% more every year. So 1.68 is 6% more than 1.59, etc. But in order to do that, you will have to invest. You will have to invest heavily in first six years in order to make this a good representative bakery store. Because you know what it takes to make a good representative bakery store. If you're a consultant, you know what it makes to make this company to run as an average company. This is your goal. Not to make it superb, just to make it do an average job. And you know what it makes to do this. You know that you need to attract customers, you have to bake good bread, whatever. So you somehow, by making these assumptions, you are able to estimate the cost, and at the end you are estimating the profits. And now you want to know how much is that worth. Well, we can just draw the typical cash flow diagram that we have been doing for the last couple of classes. In year one, you are basically losing money, 0 0.8. In year two, you are losing minus 0 0.96. In year three, in year until year six, you are losing some money. And then in year seven, you are earning 1.59. And every year, you are earning 6% more. Now we can calculate the present value of the first part. You can calculate the present value of the first part quite easily. It's just the sum of discounted present values. Just a normal sum. Now we have to calculate the present value of the second part of this cash flow stream. And what we can observe that this second part of the cash flow stream starts paying in year seven. Therefore, from year six, it looks just like a normal growing perpetuity. So we know how to calculate the present value of this <coughs> cash flow stream as looked from the perspective of year six. So in year six, if somebody gives you in year six C1 over R minus G, where C1 is 1.59, G is 6%, R is 10%. If somebody gives you this amount of dollars, 1.59 divided by 0 0.1 minus 0 0.006, if somebody gives you this amount of money, you are indifferent between this amount of money in year six and this cash flow stream that is circled in red. Now, but what is the present value of this amount of money in year six? We have to discount it for six more years and we get the present value. And therefore, we get to the present value of this horizon value. This is when we assume this constant growth and present value of these free cash flow streams in first six years. And you would get 18.8. You would get 18.8 .8 something, thousands, millions, whatever, in whatever units this was expressed. So the idea here is you model first couple of years very explicitly. You can estimate what are the costs, what are the profits, etc. But in the future, you assume some normal constant growth. And what's important about this normal constant growth is that this normal constant growth is just, <coughs> is just some rate normal rate, normal industry, you're assuming this is going to be just an average business after some time, just an average business of that kind. Now, now if you observe this slide, this is one of the slides that I have already showed you. And the point that I'm trying to make is that the explicit way how to you should do things, the formally correct way is to estimate somehow some cash flow streams that you get and you discount them. <coughs> now, if you discount these cash flow streams, you would get to the correct value of a company. But we said also some approximations. If this is a good approximation, if they are constant, they are constant, they are constant dividends paid out. And constant dividends are going to be paid out if the growth is equal to zero. And if the growth is equal to zero, actually, price of a stock today will be earnings per share divided by R. So this gives us a rationale to say that the price of a stock today is related to the earnings per share of one company. And actually, some people will use this fact 
Could you stop talking? I'm sorry. So some people will use this rationale in order to estimate the value of the company. So how do they do it? They will say the following. Let's collect prices of stocks of companies that exist out there that are doing the same business as the company whose price I'm trying to determine. I'm trying to determine price of a stock that is not traded. So I want to somehow value a company that is not trading. I, I cannot check it on Google. I want to check what's the price of Twitter. So some people say the good way to do it is check the prices of other companies doing the same similar business, but observe only those that have similar earnings per share. Some other people will not observe earnings per share. They will observe some other ratios, like book to market value or whatever. But the mechanics is the same. You select companies in the same industry, and then out of those, pick companies with similar financial ratios, like earnings per share. And there is a rationale why earnings per share should be a good indicator of the value of the company, because it's somehow related to the price, theoretically related to the price. Okay, let's do one example. Let's do one example, and this is example is valuing of the Twitter. So I have managed to find that two months ago, one big investor has decided to invest $800 million into Twitter. And <coughs> he gave them $800 million in cash for the 10% stake in the company. That means that he believes that the Twitter is worth $8 billion. Now, <coughs> what we can also observe out of publicly available data, they have said that they have basically made earn, not earnings, revenue of $200 million last year. So, uh, there is a two, and it will be funny when people hear you laughing, they have no idea what I have said when the mute button was pressed. This is cool. I can use it also for politically incorrect jokes. <laughs> so, and they say that 150 million, they are s making sales in ads. So they are basing to they are able to sell advertisements in the value of 150 million per year. But they also made 50 million dollars for selling, for selling analytic services, which means. They are selling an information, what people are tweeting about to other companies at, at of value of $50 million last year. Now, but this is not a profit. They had huge expenses. Actually, it turns out that their profit was zero. They have reinvested all because they expect high growth. They have reinvested everything. Now, but let's pretend for a second that this is all profit. That this guy thought that this is all profit. This 200 million is total profit. And let's try to approximate as a Twitter as a constant growth perpetuity. So price today must be equal C1 over R minus G. And let's assume that the next year Twitter will make 200 million dollars in profit. That means that 10 billion today must be 200 million divided by R minus G. I say here 10 billion and not 8 billion to make these numbers <coughs> nicer. And it doesn't make the point of this example any, any different. So let's assume that the value of the Twitter today is 10 billion. If the value is today 10 billion, then 2 million divided by R minus G should be the value of the Twitter also. If their profits next year are 200 million. So what do we infer from this equation? Well, we can say that R minus G is 200, over 10, 200 million over 10 billion. Well, from this we can say that G is R minus this, and G is R minus 0.02. First, notice that that implies that actually G and R are pretty close to each other. And we said that these examples are really tricky to handle, that all estimates of the price are tricky when it comes to G close to R. So, let's see what happens with the price. Let's assume that this guy has estimated 
G of 10% and R of 12%. And G of 10% is a pretty high growth rate. Because one important thing of this assumption of G of 10%, you assume that this company will continue growing forever at the rate of 10%. Not for next 10 years. You're assuming that forever you have this growth rate. And in one of the slides I have written, this constant, this perpetuous growth rate cannot be higher than what's the average in the economy, average in the industry that you are doing. And 10% growth rate is a pretty high growth rate. But let's say that these are the numbers that he has estimated. And by est using these numbers, he, he could have reached number of 10 billion. But imagine that he actually made a small mistake. That it turns out that Twitter does not grow forever at the rate of 10%, but he made a small mistake and Twitter grows at the rate of 8%. So what do we observe? Well, it turns out that the real value of Twitter is not 10 billion, but 5 billion. It's half of what he estimated. And he made a mistake, just a small mistake. It's not 10, it's 8. But you know, the value of the company decreased by half, to one half of what he has estimated. Let's push this example even further. Let's push this example further that, you know, I mean, this is not 200 million. Probably it could be easily that this is 20 million, that next year 20 million is what they're going to get. Because this year they had zero. And 20 million is much closer to zero than to 200 million. So let's say that he missed this thing. Then he would end up with the estimate of 1 billion. You see how this equation is sensitive when R is close to G? It's very sensitive. He missed the estimate of the company tenfold. And now imagine that on top of that he, missed, he made that mistake of G equal to 8%. That it turns out that G is equal to 8%. Then the whole company would be worth... 500 million, which is less than this guy has invested in total for 10%. And this guy has invested, I let's say for 10%, he invested 1 billion. Actually, he for 10%, he invested 800, billion, 800 million and the company was worth 8 billion. Now, I'm not claiming that I'm smarter than this guy, that I know better about the value of Twitter than this guy. This guy is some Russian billionaire that has made a really good investment over the last couple of years. The company is called Digital Sky Technologies and it's and it owns a large chunk of Facebook at a very low valuation compared to what Facebook is worth today. So this guy has earned billions of dollars over the last couple of years. I'm not even close to that. So don't trust me. I mean, I'm not even trying to tell you that this guy is wrong. I'm telling you how tricky these estimations are. This guy has probably much better estimates of what Twitter is going to make over the next 10 years than I do because, you know, he talks to the owner of the Twitter. He talks to him and he knows more about what's the business model of the Twitter in order to estimate future cash flow streams. I have no idea what's the business model of a Twitter. If they're trying to sell ads as they were doing over the last couple of years, they will never make it, make it if this is their only business model. Because these are not targeted ads like in Google when you search for housing and then you get housing related ads. Ads in Twitter are just some random stuff currently. So click conversion rate is small, but let's not get into these geeky details. <laughs> okay, <coughs> we are done with chapter five. We, we I just give you a short, a brief intro, two minute intro to what we're gonna do in chapter six. So what's chapter six about? I mean, there we will not learn many more new stuff. So everything boils around the present concept of present value. But in this chapter, I will try to talk about alternative methods to evaluating whether investment is good or not. We said investment is a good if it has a positive net present value. But it turns out that there are some other methodologies to, to, to value an investment, to choose among the investment. And if you ask, chief financial officers of some companies, which method do they use to choose among alternative investments? Which decision tool do they use? It turns out that chief financial officers love net present value. 75% of chief financial officers use net present value. But they also use some alternative methods. And one that is even more popular than net present value is called internal rate of return. And we will learn what is internal rate of return in the next class, among other things. But I will still try to convince you that no matter that m 
some financial officers prefer internal rate of return over net present value, I believe that the net present value is superior method for as a decision tool to choose among investments. And there are some other less popular methods that are really easy and fast, and we will talk about these methods about these methods as well. But the idea of the next class is the main idea is compare different decision tools for choosing among different investments and showing you which one is the better and what are the limitations of this. You have to be aware of the limits that these methods face on you. And by this I would end this.